Thank you, Kathy. Uh, good morning. I'm Marshall Bennett of Wolf Popper Law Firm, and um, I've had 16 years experience uh, as the uh, state treasurer of Mississippi and trustee for the Mississippi PERS um, Investments uh, Committee as chairman. Um, at NC PERS, Chet Wallman and I over the years have provided information to you to alert you about scams of the 21st century. At the 2012 NC PERS conference, we spoke about the Galleon Group scandal, a seven-year-long global insider trading conspiracy. It was a $7 billion hedge fund. Raj Raja Nam, Galleon's founder and chief, was found guilty of insider trading and fined $156 million and sentenced to 11 years in prison. More than 60 other people pled guilty or were found guilty of securities fraud and insider trading viol violations. But there's more to this incredible but true story of greed, conspiracy, and ego on Wall Street. Last year, the U.S. government investigation of Galleon led to the criminal indictment of an even bigger fish, SAC Capital. SAC is a $14 billion fund, nearly twice the size of Galleon. Its founder is Stephen A. Cohen. Hmm, his initials are SAC. He named the company after himself. Has he now become the new Wolf of Wall Street legend? Well, to give us the update on this case, Chad Wallman of our firm has over 20 years experience in investigating uh, these scandals and frauds. Chet. Well, thank you, Marshall. Good morning, everybody. During the, during the course of my presentation here today, I'll try to answer four questions. The first, very briefly, is what is insider trading? The second is what is the SAC scandal and how did it occur? Third, I'll try to answer how the government broke the case and lastly, I'll try to bring it back to you and answer how insider trading actually impacts your funds. Well, first, very briefly, to make sure we're on the, uh, the same page, insider trading occurs when a person knows of material, non-public information or confidential information that a, that a company has, and he then buys or sells the securities of that company, generally the stock, before the information is released to the public. The person can also tip that inside information to somebody else who trades prior to the, that information being released to the public. But the information has to be material. And what that means is it is likely to move the stock price up or down. Examples of material information would be, for example, if a company is about to come out with a great new product that it expects to increase its revenues. When the news of that comes out, the stock price is likely to go up. Contrary to that is if you know that a, stock, that a company is about to report very disappointing earnings, you know that when that information comes out, the stock price is likely to go down. Insider trading is illegal because it gives somebody who has inside information an advantage over others. It is considered a securities fraud, and it is also considered violations of other potential laws. That brings us to SAC Capital. And any story about SAC Capital has to start with its founder, Wall Street legend Stevie A. Cohn. Stevie grew up on Long Island in a middle class background, and he was a very smart kid. He went to the Ivy League school, the University of Pennsylvania, and very, very early on, he developed an interest in the stock market, specifically the way prices and stocks traded. Immediately upon graduating from college in 1978, he went to work for a 100-year-old, what was called a small, sleepy brokerage firm named Gruntal & Company. Stevie Cohn started out his Wall Street career as what was known as a tape reader. 
That's someone like a day trader, someone who doesn't necessarily have to know anything about a company, but he st simply looks at the way a stock is trading. And he can tell if it's going up, will it continue to go up or go down? And Stevie Cohn was great at tape reading. In fact, the first day he was at Gruntal, he made $10,000 for the firm trading. And the way Gruntal paid its brokers was that it gave them 60% of anything that they made trading. The company Gruntal kept the other 40%. The first day Stevie Cohn traded, he made $10,000 for the company. In his first year trading by himself, he made $100,000. Now, for a 21-year-old kid back in the late 70s, that was a nice little chunk of change. By his second year trading, he made a million dollars. By his mid-20s, he was making five to $10 million per year. However, by the time he was in his mid-30s, he started to get frustrated with the management at Gruntal because they, eliminated, they limited the amount of capital he could trade to $50 million. And he wanted to make bigger bets, trade bigger amounts of capital so he could make even more money. So he decided he was going to leave the company, but he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. That was until one day he got a very fortuitous phone call from somebody who was asking about a job applicant reference for somebody who used to work for Stevie Cohn. During the course of that co conversation, Cohn asked, well, what kind of company do you work for? And the guy said, I work for a hedge fund. At the time, Cohn said he did not know what a hedge fund was from a hedgehog. But nonetheless, as they talked, he was intrigued by the idea of a hedge fund, and shortly thereafter, he, owned, he opened up SAC Capital with $25 million, half of which was his own money. In the first year that SAC Capital was in existence, it made a 51% return. Three years later, it had almost quadrupled the capital under management. But SAC really took off at the end of the 1990s when riding up the technology stock bubble both up and they guessed right when it went down. In fact, during the years 1998 through 2000, SAC posted annual returns of 70% each year. Capital started to pour in from outside investors and as Marshall mentioned, by 2012 it had $14 billion under management. SAC used this capital to trade incredible volumes of stock. It would trade 20 million shares a day. At its peak, 3% of all the stock that was traded on the New York Stock Exchange came from SAC's traders, and 1% of all stock traded on NASDAQ. In 2000, Business Week had an article that crowned Cone the most powerful trader on Wall Street you've never heard of. And all of this, these returns caused SAC to charge incredible feel, fees. They charged 50 and 3, far greater than other hedge funds. Yet, if you were an investor at SAC, you did phenomenally. Their 18-year average return was 25% after the extraordinary fees it was charging, which was an, way better than other uh, hedge funds were doing at the time. Now, all of this success made Stevie Cohn a very wealthy man. How wealthy? His net worth is reported at more than $10 billion. Stevie Cohn lives in the largest mansion in a community of mansions in Greenwich, Connecticut. Here is actually a picture of his house, uh, which has 30 rooms on 14 acres. It has a basketball court, an ice skating rink, and a small golf course. Stevie Cohn also owns a large mansion in the Hamptons and has tens of millions of dollars invested in real estate. In fact, one of those pieces of real estate is a penthouse apartment in New York City, which is currently on sale, and any of you can buy it for his asking price of $115 million. Now, a few years ago, Stevie Cohn famously tried to acquire the Los Angeles Dodgers. He lost out to Magic Johnson and his group, and he settled for a minority stake in the New York Mets. As a long-suffering New York Mets fan, I believe his luck started to change once he invested in the team. 
Now, in addition to his huge real estate holdings, he has assembled one of the greatest art collections in the world. P hundreds of paintings and large sculptures, including this giant sculpture of a balloon dog, which sits at, at, on his dra driveway in Greenwich, Connecticut. He owns art paintings of Picasso, Monet, Van Gogh, Andy Warhol. His art collection is estimated to be worth $1 billion. He is as famous in the art world as he is in the financial world. Well, how did SAC and Cohn become so successful? Well, some people have called Stevie Cohn the greatest trader of his generation. And he was smart enough to surround himself with brilliant and aggressive traders and people at SAC. SAC hired 100 or so portfolio managers, and each, of, each manager was surrounded by two or three analysts. A portfolio manager and his team of analysts at SAC were called a pod, like a pod of whales. And each came with tremendous credentials from the finest universities and graduate schools. And they lived in a world that was very competitive. At SAC, you either made money or you were fired. The average portfolio manager lasted about four years. And they were paid very handsomely if they stayed. But the atmosphere there was explained as gladiatorial. Not only did these people work hard and were, were smart, but they also worked incredibly long hours, not only during the week, but they were given homework every weekend, and every side, Sunday night, Stevie Cohn presided over a conference call with all his portfolio managers where they had to report what they were going to do for the coming weeks. Notwithstanding everything that was going on at SAC, many in the media, on Wall Street, and certainly at the government, suspected that the reason that SAC was performing so wondrously was because it was doing something illegal, and most suspected that what it was doing was insider trading. The rumors of insider trading came for many years because it was fairly well known on Wall Street that SAC was very aggressive in pressing various, various Wall Street firms and others for information. And these firms would ingratiate SAC by providing them tips of information. For example, analyst reports were provided by certain firms to SAC prior to being provided to the other clients. Now, some people would say, why would the Wall Street firms do it? Because SAC was very smart. It traded such incredible volumes of shares, and it could have done this directly through computers for pennies a share per trade. But instead, it elected to trade through Wall Street firms, which charged them close to it closer to a dollar per share. And this made these Wall Street firms essentially uh, would have to kiss the ring of SAC. By 2000, SAC was spending as much as $150 million in commissions to big Wall Street firms. And that number went up to $300 million more recently, making it the largest customer on Wall Street. As of 2012, neither SAC nor Cohn had ever been charged with any unlawful conduct despite the rumors for years that something was wrong with the firm. However, it has recently come out in a, in a transcript relating to a, a suit by Stevie Cohn's ex-wife that back in 1986, before SAC was formed, Stevie Cohn was investigated for insider trading and at his deposition in that case, he refused to testify and instead asserted his Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself. Yet he was not charged in that scandal for doing anything wrong or that investigation. The government, however, got a lucky break in 2006 when a lawyer named John Moon went to the United States Securities Exchange Office in New York with a suspicion that the small, one of this this lawyer's smallest clients, a tiny hedge fund called Sedna Capital Management, was doing something wrong. Sedna Capital Management only had $2 million under management, not billion, million, yet it had doubled the, and the amount on, under management in one or two trades, and this caused John Moon to report them. Well, at, at first, the SEC wasn't too interested in a tiny little firm like this until it Googled 
said the capital management, and learned that it was run by the brother of Raj Rajaratnam, the billionaire, the billionaire founder of the Galleon Group, who the government, like it was interested in SAC, was interested and is suspected of insider trading for a long time. Very shortly thereafter, by focusing in on Sedna and Galleon, the government was able to get low-level managers and people at companies who had insider trading and they were caught red-handed. The government then forced these smaller fish to wear wires, just like a mob investigation. And while they wore wires talking to others about insider trading, bigger and bigger fish were, were caught until it was learned that the Galleon Group scandal was global in scope and encompassed dozens and dozens of people. Well, by 2008, the names of former SAC traders started to come up on these wiretaps, and the government started to turn these traders. One of these people was a man named John Horvath. John Horvath agreed to cooperate with the government after they caught him. Specifically, John Horvath gave the government an email that he had sent in August of 2008 when he worked with a portfolio manager named Michael Steinberg, who was very high up at SAC. He sent them an email that said, based on a second-hand read from someone at the company, Dell, the computer company's earnings for the next quarter would be disappointing. A second-hand read from someone at the company means I spoke to somebody at Dell and they told me they're about to report bad earnings, which means the stock price is going to go down. Well, Michael Steinberg, upon getting this email, immediately forwarded it to Stevie Cohn. Within 10 minutes of receiving that email, Stevie Cohn, Stevie Cohn sold a $12.5 million stake that he had in Dell, making a cool $1 million profit right before the news of the disappointing quarter came out and the stock plummeted. Now, interestingly, Cohn's lawyer said it was a coincidence that he sold just 10 minutes after the email was received since he never read it. For his part, Horvath has pled guilty to the insider trading at Dell while he was at SAC. But the government really got lucky later in 2008 when regulators at the New York Stock Exchange noticed very suspicious trading leading up to the announcement of a potentially new great drug for treating Alzheimer's disease, which was called Bapi Nuzmumab, or Bapi for short, which was being co-developed by two publicly traded companies, Elan and Wyeth. And the New York Stock Exchange noted that the suspicious trading had come from SAC. The New York Stock Exchange then gave that information to the Securities and Exchange Commission, who immediately started to subpoena people outside of SAC to try to see if there was any communications between SAC and anybody related to those companies. After subpoenaing these people, the SEC found communications had gone on between a Matthew Martoma, who at the time was a 35-year-old portfolio manager at SAC, and a Dr. Sidney Gilman, who was a neurology professor at the University of Michigan. But more interesting, Dr. Gilman was the chairman of the committee that was monitoring the Bobby clinical trials. Now, Martonema was smart and diligent, like others at SAC, and he, as soon as he learned that drug trials were ongoing that were determining whether Bobby would be an effective drug, he learned the names of the 20 doctors who were presiding over those clinical drug trials. And working through what's called an expert networking firm, which is actually firms that, that connect Wall Street money managers with industry experts, such as people, doctors working on clinical drug trials, they, gave, they ended up connecting Martoma with the, the good Dr. Gilman. And he, he was able to arrange 42 consultations with Dr. Gilman as well as one of the other 19 doctors who were working on the, on the clinical drug trial. Ultimately, SAC paid Dr. Gilman $108,000 for his consultations. Before the clinical drug trials were released, 
Dr. Gilman provided Martoma with the final results. And those final results show that BAPI was not an effective drug and would not work in treating Alzheimer's disease, which meant that once the news came out, which it did, the stock prices in both of those stocks dropped like a stone. But not coincidentally, after acquiring a huge position in both Elan and Wyeth, how huge? $700 million worth of huge at SAC. SAC sold off nearly all of its shares and shorted those two stocks on the last trading day before those bad news boppy results came out. According to the government, they made $276 million or otherwise avoided that much in losses on that one day of trading, which the SAC has alleged is the largest insider trade in history. For his efforts, Martoma received a bonus of $9.4 million relating to solely the trading that we just talked about. Now, in 2012, the FBI, who was amassing information, confronted Dr. Gilman, who immediately agreed to turn evidence as long as he wasn't prosecuted. And armed with that evidence, the FBI went to visit Matthew Martoma at his home in Florida. And they went to him and said, you're either going to cooperate with us or the next time you see us, we're going to arrest you. Upon hearing that news, Martoma fainted in front of his wife and three kids on the front lawn of his house. When he awoke, though, he was very defiant and to this day has remained so and has not cooperated with the government. Now, people ask, did Cohn know about the insider trading at Boppy? Well, at SAC, a portfolio manager and his team were expected to provide their best and brightest ideas to Stevie Cohn. And if Stevie traded in his personal account and made money, the team would receive 4% of everything Cohn made. Martoma provided Elan and Wyeth on his list of best ideas to Cohn, and Cohn invested in it. And he invested in those two stocks big time. 400 million of the 700 million at, SAT, at, at SAC invested in those two stocks were invested in Cohn's own account. Phone records that the FBI got showed that Martoma had a phone call with Cohn for 20 minutes on Sunday morning, July 20th, 2008, apparently about the status of the Boppy clinical trial, because immediately after that call, Cohn started to unload his entire position in those stocks. Now, finally, in November 2012, the SEC commenced a civil action against SAC for insider trading. A civil action seeks to get back money. And after years of denying that they had ever done anything wrong at SAC, within three and a half months, SAC agreed to pay the largest fine in SEC history, $616 million, to settle the charges in just the trading in Wyeth and Elan and Dell that we just talked about. Within a week after the announcement of that settlement, very publicly, Stevie Cohn ended up purchasing from casino owner Steve Wynn a Picasso painting, La Rive, for $155 million, it was, million. dollars. It was the largest purchase of art by a U.S. collector in history. And that was actually a famous painting because Steve Wynn had accidentally put his elbow through the painting in 2006, but apparently it didn't impact its value that much. Days later, Stevie Cohn purchased a Hamptons house for $60 million. Now, many in the media and Wall Street basically felt that Stevie Cohn was giving the finger to the government, saying, I just paid you more than a half a billion dollars, and that does not impact me in the slightest. And apparently, the government got the message, because four months later, they brought, in, they brought a charges against Stevie Cohn for failing to supervise both Mr. Martoma and Mr. Steinberg. And they are seeking to bar him from the financial industry and from managing other people's money. That case has not been settled. But the news for SAC got much worse because 
A few days later, the SAC, the, not the SAC, the U.S. Department of Justice brought a criminal indictment against SAC, charging it with, amongst other things, securities fraud for a period that ran from 1999 through 2010. That's more than a decade. The, DA, the Department of Justice's charges, and it's hard for me to see this, so I'm going to look at this for a second. The B Department of Justice charges portrayed SAC as a company in which insider trading was substantial, pervasive, and on a scale without known precedent in the hedge fund industry. In announcing the indictment, the U.S. Attorney for Manhattan stated that, quote, SAC seated itself with corrupt traders, empowered to engage in criminal acts by a culture that looked the other way despite red flags all around. SAC deliberately encouraged the no-holds-barred pursuit of an edge that literally carried it over the edge into corporate criminality, close quote. Now, many of you may not realize, but a criminal indictment of a company as opposed to a person is exceedingly rare. And it's really rare ever since the government indicted Arthur Anderson in connection with the Enron scandal. When it did so, that had amounted to a death sentence for Arthur Anderson, putting one of the largest accounting firms out of business, causing thousands of employees who had nothing to do with the wrongdoing in Enron or anything else, their jobs. So the government's very hesitant to do that. But the insider trading at SAC over a period of more than a decade was considered so outrageous that the government decided to criminally indict SAC. Eight former SAC employees are mentioned in the criminal indictment, and everyone has either pled guilty or has been found guilty after a jury trial of insider trading. Both Steinberg and Martoma refused to cooperate with the government. They went through jury trials and lost, and they're going to be sentenced soon. In November of 2013, SAC Capital agreed to plead guilty to all counts of the criminal in indictment. It agreed to stop managing funds for any in outside investors, and it agreed to pay a $1.2 billion fund. fine. When you add the $616 million it paid to the SEC, SAC Capital in total paid $1.8 billion in fines, the largest fines in history for insider trading. The firm, just about a month ago, changed its name to Point 72 Asset Management. It now trades just Cone's own money, which is nine to $10 billion, uh, but it no longer trades for any outside investors. Well, many people come to me and they say, well, why would successful, qualified people like those at SAC participate in insider trading? The most obvious answer, of course, is greed. Martoma, who was 35 years old at the time, made over $9 million for his insider trading in Elan and Wyeth. And Stevie Cohn, if he's ever found guilty, criminally indicted, made billions of dollars. There's also a huge pressure to produce in the hedge fund world. Since 1990, hedge funds have gone from about 70 to over 2,500. That means there's a huge competition in the industry to produce top returns. Because if you're an investor, you're going to go to the hedge fund that has higher returns. And they need an edge to get higher returns. And the edge, at least SAC Capital and Galleon sought, was inside information. Because it's much easier to, to, to trade in the stock market if you know which way it's going to go before everyone else does. Now, I find, found it very interesting that one of the government witnesses interviewed in connection with the SAC Capital was, case was, was asked by the government, how prevalent is insider trading in the hedge fund world, at least as of 2012? And he said, his quote was that you could not, no hedge fund would survive without trafficking and illegal information. And he likened it to doping in the professional cycling world, like Lance Armstrong. If you weren't doing it, there was no way you could be a top trader. 
Similarly, the steroid era in baseball is another fine example. Which brings us back to you guys. How does insider trading actually impact your fund? Because it surely does. Every time someone buys shares on inside information, the opposite side of the trade is deceived and disadvantaged. For example, if your stock companies were buying the stocks of Wyeth and Elan back in 2008 because you expected Bopi to be this great new drug and you did not know that the drug trials had already shown that Bopi was not effective, a fact that, that SAC apparently had, you lost money when they made millions and millions of dollars. When investors see stories like this, they lose confidence in the stock market and they tend not to invest. And if less investors are in the market, that means less liquidity and that also means less available capital to, to companies. So because this is not good for a market system, the federal securities laws permit traders, permit um, those who are disadvantaged or harmed by insider trading to actually sue for their losses against the wrongdoers. Well, how can you know if your fund has a legal claim and has in been impacted by insider trading? The answer is portfolio monitoring and retaining Securities Litigation Council. That is not my speech. I am done. But that is something that each and every one of your funds should have. If you don't have it, see me after. I know a lot of other firms are here and have talked about this. But you need it to at least understand that you've been harmed. And I now can take any questions in the minute or so I have, if I have a minute. OK, we're out of time. If anybody wants to ask questions or see me, uh, you can talk to either Marshall or I right after this presentation. Thank you all.